Thank you for the nice introduction. My name is Eleftheria Tsakalozu, and during my talk today, I will be discussing how physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling can be used to guide study design and product development for generic dermatological products. My disclaimer. The first objective of this talk is to understand the considerations for establishing bioequivalence for generic dermatological drug products. For those that are not familiar with physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling, I will be providing a short introduction. Together, we will explore how PVPK modeling can be used to support decisions over the entire life cycle of a generic drug product, from its development to its approval. The first portion of my talk will highlight the challenges in generic drug product development and establishing bioequivalents that are specific to dermatological drug products. The larger portion of my talk will allude to the role of PBPK modeling and simulation towards informing decisions on the design of cutaneous pharmacokinetic studies and establishing a safe space for drug product attributes. I will end this talk with take home messages. The agency has provided recommendations on establishing bioequivalence for generic dermatological drug products. These include comparative clinical endpoint bioequivalence studies. However, these studies may not be sensitive enough in detecting formulation differences. There is large variability associated with the observed response and these products are, are of modest clinical efficacy. B studies with PK endpoints are included into the agency's recommendations. However, it is often the case that systemic exposure is not detectable following the application of a semi-solid dosage form. And even if systemic exposure is quantifiable, it may not reflect local concentrations. Finally, drug product characterization studies are included into the agency's recommendations. So how can we implement in silico methodologies for generic dermatological products in an effort to meet those challenges? For a drug that is not intended to be absorbed in the bloodstream, such as semi-solid dosage forms, the agency may consider establishing alternative scientifically valid methods to show bioequivalence if the alternative methods are expected to detect a significant difference between the drug and the listed drug in safety and therapeutic effect. In silico methodologies bring together information on drug product characterization and skin bioavailability to answer questions on drug product development and bioequivalence for topical drug products. For those that are not familiar with physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling, I would like to use the next couple of minutes to provide you with a brief introduction. First, I would like to draw your attention to the schematic, which illustrates the complexity of the skin. The skin is composed of multiple um, layers, the stratum corneum, the val epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis, and its continuity is often interrupted by skin appendages, which may include hair follicles and sweat glands. A more simplified version of the skin structure is shown on the left. The drug product is shown in blue at the top and the major skin layers are shown as compartments. Permeation of the drug substance through the skin can be modeled by diffusion within each one of these layers and by partitioning from one layer to the other. Metabolism as well as clearance via the lymphatic system and the blood flow may also be um, modeled. So this relatively simplified um, skin disposition model can be coupled with a full body PBPK model where every single organ is modeled by a compartment. Uh, PBPK modeling allows the integration of information on the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the formulation as well as the physiology, taking into consideration aspects of variability and population and allows us to predict the disposition, the pharmacokinetics of the drug substance in every single one of the organs that you see on the right and the skin layers that you see on the left. 
So how can we use PBPK modeling and simulation? I would like to move on into some specific examples. The first one um, is on the approval of a generic taclofenac topical gel 1%. In support of their submission, ANDA 211253, the applicant submitted a dermal PVPK model for their product, Daclofenac Sodium Topical Gel 1%. The structure of the dermal model is shown on the left, and I'm sure that you can appreciate its complexity. The dermal PVPK model was used to support an alternative B approach for a generic product that was Q1, Q2, Q3 same to the reference product. The alternative B approach did not include an in vivo comparative clinical endpoint study, although this study was recommended in the product specific guidance. The dermal PVPK model was leveraged for virtual bioequivalence assessment on predicted systemic and local exposure. Now I would like to move on to additional examples that illustrate how PBPK modeling and simulation can be used to inform decisions on the development of a drug product. The first example is how a dermal PBPK model can be leveraged towards informing decisions on study design for a percutaneous PK study. Dr. Ramanzani earlier today provided us with a detailed description of dermal open flow microperfusion studies. This slide aims to refresh your memory of the most popular percutaneous PK studies. These are the dermal microdialysis studies as well as the dermal open flow microperfusion studies. The concept behind those studies is simple. A probe is inserted into the dermis um, under the skin surface where a product is applied. Samples of the interstitial fluid are constantly collected and the drug substance, the active ingredient of interest is um, quantified. This methodology allows us to understand and describe the disposition of um, the drug substance of interest, the, inactive, the active ingredient of interest over time, as you can see on the two um, graphs on the right. The first example I would like to discuss with you today is a dermal PPPK model that was developed internally for a metronidazole topical gel. The systemic disposition of metronidazole was described with a minimal PPPK model, and skin absorption parameters informed by QSAR models were um, uh, optimized based on systemic PK data. We informed the model by incorporating formulation attributes. These um, included viscosity and pH, as well as vehicle evaporation, among others. We assess the performance of the model by comparing systemic exposure data with the model predictions, and we assess the capability of the model to describe redistribution from the systemic circulation to the dermis for metronidazole by leveraging literature data. We use the model, um, the platform, to develop additional dermal PPPK models for other metronidazole topical drug products, and that increased our confidence in um, the platform that we were using. We used the model to simulate different scenarios where different amounts of the drug product, ranging from 0.5 to 30 milligrams per meter square, were applied and the disposition of metronidazole was predicted in the dermis. On the top uh, graph, you see the C max plotted against the drug product amount for these different scenarios. And at the bottom, um, you can see the AUC plotted against um, the drug product amounts again. At this point, it is important to be able to validate these dermal uh, model predictions with a pilot um, dermal microdialysis or DOFM study. Um, and now I'd like to discuss how we can actually use this model first to inform study design decisions and answer what if scenarios. We can use this model I just walked you through 
um, to answer questions on um, what should be our application methodology, whether we should conduct our study under occlusion, what should be our sampling scheme, in other words, for how long and how often should we um, sample the dermis in order to get a complete PK profile? What should be the dose we should use and um, for how long should we apply the product? What should our expectations be for the positive and negative controls we will include in our study? Should we conduct our study in healthy volunteers or patients? Should we recruit males or females or both? The model can also help us identify appropriate PK parameters for BE assessment in the dermis. Should we uh, propose CMAX, AUC, both, or include additional PK parameters? And the model can help us determine an appropriate dose range for the applied drug product with discriminatory capability for the test and the reference product. The model can also help us assess what is the extent of redistribution for metronidazole from the plasma to the dermis. This is an important part of model validation and it can be critical when model predictions are used for local BE assessments. So the model can help us predict what would be the dermis um, PK profile shown here in red when we have a specific um, uh, PK profile for metronidazole in the plasma. Since we included formulation attributes into the model, it can be used to identify the ones that may impact local and systemic exposure. Here we conducted sensitivity analysis and um, saw that an increase in the pH of the drug product from 4 to 8 results in a decrease in the local bioavailability of metronidazole in the dermis. Moving on to the second example now on how PVPK modeling and simulation can be used to inform decisions on the development of drug products and especially how it can be used to justify deviations on formulation attributes and define a safe space. Safe space is a space for formulation attributes uh, where um, bioequivalence is anticipated. For this example, I will use the in vitro permeation testing setup. Um, Dr. Patel yesterday provided us with a very detailed description of this experimental methodology. So I will just use this slide to remind you of the different options that are available for IVPT and also highlight that um, this methodology can be used to describe in a quantitative manner the rate and extent at which a drug substance, an active ingredient, is appearing in the receptor solution following application. Um, this rate and extent can be specific to the product and also to the experimental conditions. IVPT also allows us to quantify amounts of the um, active ingredient in the skin if desirable. This second case study is supported by a dermal PVPK model that was developed for ethanyl estradiol transdermal delivery system. The systemic disposition of ethanyl estradiol was described by a minimal PBPK model and skin absorption parameters were informed by QSAR models and optimized based on systemic PK data. The loaded dose, the application area and the application site were also taken into consideration during drug product development. We assess the performance of the model by comparing systemic exposure data to model predictions. Um, validation of the IVPT model predictions that you will see on the right here um, were also validated against observed data um, through a pilot study. The model allows us for um, predictions on the ethanol estradiol amounts in the receptor solution media a mean PK profile, IVPT profile, um, was generated as well as variability um, around it. The simulations continued for 168 hours, which are equal to the seven day uh, wear period that is recommended for this product. Um, now the same model can be used to assess what would be the impact of um, varying the loading dose, for instance. 
um, we examined two scenarios. The first, in the first scenario, we increased the loading dose by 10%, and in under scenario two, we decreased the loading dose by 10%. And you can see um, the model predictions in blue and red for scenario one and two, respectively. The true power of PVPK modeling, though, lays with the fact that it can allow it allows us to predict what would be the impact on these changes on the in vivo performance um, of the uh, product. Um, so the predicted PK profiles under scenario one and under scenario two are shown um, on the graph on the right with the blue and the red line um, respectively. As we develop an IVPT model such as the one I just described, it is very important to take a couple of uh, points into consideration. First of all, the experimental conditions need to be captured properly in the IVPT model. Um, whether the study, the IVPT study, was conducted in a study in a static or flow through cell, what was the sampling methodology, what was the solubility of the active ingredient in the receptor solution, um, what are the characteristics of the excised skin in terms of its thickness, preparation, and storage. These need to be um, included into the IVPT model. The IVPT study design needs also to be captured properly into the IVPT model, where the excised skin um, obtained from a male or a female, what was their age, what, is the, what was the application site, how many uh, donors were included in the study and how many replicates, what was the variability that was observed in the IVPT study? Are all these captured properly by the IVPT model? Additionally, um, the IVPT model needs to be validated. The IVPT study design should show to be sensitive to drug product differences. Similarly, model predictions should be sensitive to drug product differences. I'm hoping that with this talk, I have convinced you that dermal PVPK models for generic dermatological drug products can be used to support development of a drug product by informing decisions on study design and deviations on Q1, Q2, Q3 attributes, and also to support alternative B approaches leading to drug product approval. If you are considering including PVPK modeling and simulation in support of your ANDA submission, we encourage you to um, engage and interact with the agency early um, to receive feedback and input on your modeling approach. The pre-NDA meeting program um, under GADUFA2 is an excellent platform for that. Model development is an intense and resource demanding process due to the fact that um, the models that are developed are complex and so are the drug products. And there are limitations in data availability in model development and validation. For that reason, applicants are encouraged to follow best practices when developing dermal PBPK models. The guidance for industry physiologically based pharmacokinetic analysis format and content by the FDA is an excellent resource for that. At this point, I would like to thank uh, my team lead, Dr. Andrew Babiskin, and our division director, Dr. Liang Zhao, the rest of my um, team members and um, colleagues from the Division of Therapeutic Performance, Dr. Zhang and Dr. Lionberger um, from the immediate office for their support and guidance. This is a list of all the GADUFA funded grants supporting dermal PVPK modeling and simulation approaches. Please follow the link for more information. I will be happy to take any questions you might have during the panel discussion session. Our challenge question, PVPK models for generic dermatological drug products can be used to support development of a drug product prior to its approval, alternative B approaches for product approval, both A and B. And the correct answer is both A and B. Thank you very much for your attention.